in February 2014. Things went well from the beginning, yet a progression of flowing occasions changed everything in a split second. Then as their companions' lives remained in a critical state, the jumpers confronted unfathomably painful choices. This is the sickening story of the Plora Cave. Catastrophe less tact is exhorted. Kai Keenan is a notable, Finnish jumper, who cut his teeth at the quarry. However, he encountered his most memorable submerged misfortune while plunging with a long-term companion at one more close by quarry in 2013. Not long after the two entered the water, Kai saw that his accomplice wasn't moving and his controller had dropped out of his mouth. Kay promptly maneuvered him back on onto the ice, started revival and called crisis administrations. A salvage helicopter showed up soon after that. Yet by then, his companion was dead. A post-mishap examination uncovered that he just neglected to open the oxygen valve on his rebreather. Kai was troubled over the occurrence and promised to surrender cave plunging for good. Yet by then, it had turned into an enthusiasm that he was unable to leave. Not long after that episode, Kai immediately got back to the water with companions and individual jumpers, Patrick, Risk, Yari, Rinin, and Vasaranin. Still, his timing could never have been any more regrettable. Very quickly, he saw one more lethal mishap over a wreck close tanned Estonia, one of his kindred jumpers vanished while dropping toward the wreck that day. Salvage jumpers were brought in to look for the missing man, yet their endeavors were fruitless. Later, Kai and two others found his dead body in around 230 FT-70M of water. However, even with two new misfortunes, Kai actually couldn't surrender, cave plunging, and only a couple of months after the fact he started arranging another jump. This would yet be his most perilous testing and actually requesting jump. Norway's Plura stream starts in Lake Sanede and twists through the picturesque. Plura Valley, it's widely viewed as Northern Europe's biggest waterfill normal cavern, actually all things being equal. Norwegians didn't start investigating it until the mid-90s, on the grounds that before then, the accessible plunging gear simply didn't depend on task. Then with further developed and strong hardware jumpers were starting to wander further into the cavern than any time in recent memory in mid-2014. Kai and four other Finnish jumpers were going to set out on one more amazing plunge at the Plura Cave Complex. Kai would be joined by 42-year-old firefighter Patrick, 40-year-old creation administrator Yari, and 33-year-old electrical creator Visa, and 34-year-old mechanical specialist Arid Yaru. Every one of the five were confirmed cavern jumpers and experienced specialized jumpers. This really intended that, as per public and global norms, they were completely able to embrace such an aggressive cavern plunge that would take them in excess of 320 FT or 100 MERS underneath the outer layer of the Plura waterway. A couple of years sooner, Kayan Yari had established an informal completion record by plunging 688. FT-210M in the Halala Quarry in eastern Finland, likewise Kayan, Patrick had as of now crossed the entry that associated the Plura Cavern's two known passages. The past fall, with such a lot of involvement under their belts, they were naturally certain that they could pull it off again. Yet this time they do. The navigate the other way. The underlying plummet to the Plura opening must be made underneath the outer layer of a little lake. The arrangement was to break into two gatherings, with start time staggered two hours separated. Assuming that all went well, they'd navigate in around five hours and be back home completely safe late the following day. The men moved into Yar's van on February 5th, 2014. The trailer hitched to the van, stacked with a snowmobile, submerged bikes, many plunging chambers, and numerous extra miscellaneous items. During the excursion through Finland, Sweden, and Norway, the restless jumpers poured over everything about their arrangement to guarantee the trip was protected and fruitful. Then, only a couple of hours from their last objective, the snow and ice-covered streets turned out to be progressively dangerous and deceptive. At one point, Yari scarcely recovered control of the B-seconds before it greened into a trench. After the episode, the stunned tenants shared a couple of anxious chuckles and recognized their favorable luck. 
prior to halting for a generous breakfast of bacon and eggs, then almost 16 hours after the excursion started, they showed up at Portage Mix Homestead right off the bat. February 6th, prior to resigning to their rooms, they determinedly conveyed the most delicate stuff into the Gar carport, so it wouldn't be frozen strong the next morning when, required a short time later, Yari chose to head to sleep while the others partook in some. Merited loggers prior to turning in themselves, they consented to stay in bed until 8, 00 a.m., to guarantee they got a lot of rest when they woke. The temperature had decreased to well beneath freezing, and the sun didn't show up until 9, 00 a.m. The men were separated into two gatherings. The first included Patrick and Yari. They had entered the cavern first, and after two hours, Cavesa and Yari would follow them in similar bearing. The stunned flights would permit the dregs worked up by the main gathering to settle. At the point when the subsequent gathering entered the cavern yet more critically, it would permit one gathering to help the other, assuming something turned out badly, as the tenth hour gravitated toward Kvesa and Yari. You started setting up the stuff while Patrick and Yari H. started up the trimming tool and started cutting an opening in the ice-covered lake, when they at long last penetrated through the thick layer of ice. They were satisfied to find the water was obvious to such an extent that they could see the rough base almost 60 F or 80 M down the jumpers were in especially positive feelings with first-rate conditions, adequate wrist and full guts as they worked. Patrick took a video of himself and Yari H. making last arrangements. Then, as Yari flashed up the rear of Patrick's dry suit, he inquired as to whether he naturally suspected they ought to proceed the plunge. Yari answered by motioning down toward the water with his right hand. The significance was clear. We're going then only a couple of moments evening. Patrick pointed his camera at the opening in the ice, and Yari slid himself into the cold water starting. Off behind schedule was definitely not an extraordinary thought, yet it didn't appear to be an immense arrangement. Since the DI was simply expected to require around five hours having completed their arrangements, Kai and Yaru showed up to wish Patrick and Yar H. best of luck minutes before they started up their submerged bikes and started plummeting towards the entry of the lowered cavern. The submerged bikes seemed to be gimmicky devices from an old James Bond film. Still, they were fundamental apparatuses in light of the fact that they permitted the jumpers to move rapidly and cover more ground while moderating valuable energy as they worked their direction down the cavern, the men. Likewise, utilized shut-circuit stuff, or rebreathers, rather than customary open-circuit gear. The thing that matters is that with close-circuit, hardware breathed out, gases aren't released into the water. Rather, scrubbers eliminate the carbon dioxide, after which a combination of new oxygen, nitrogen, and helium are recycled to the jumper through their controller known as the Tri-X. This imperative three-gas mix can be changed, relying upon plunge profundity, individual inclination, and a few different factors, yet even with the most recent and most progressive stuff the men must be perceptive of, a few age-old dangers, one of which was hypercapnia is by and large caused while a breaking-down rebreather unit neglects to eliminate the carbon dioxide breathed out by the jumper. This prompts hazardous developments of carbon dioxide in the blood prompting tipsiness, confusion, exhaustion, and queasiness. Shut circuit rebreathing frameworks can fundamentally expand. The time jumpers stay lowered, yet they likewise have a few serious disadvantages. Since they're more perplexing, they're additionally more inclined to glitch. Furthermore, when not appropriately acclimated to every individual, the tricks can cause jumpers to feel all the more certain and in some cases somewhat euphoric. These sentiments can prompt unfortunate choices and superfluous gamble-taking. Patrick and Yari H. had utilized rebreathers previously, yet they chose to convey an extra unit and additional chambers in the event that their essential gear bombed now. Inside the cavern entrance, they slowly slipped over in excess of 1,600 500 M prior to entering a 800 T 250 M long chamber that was fundamentally loaded up with water subsequent to pausing for a minute to value their exceptional environmental elements. 
they went on down to a profundity of almost 420 FT or 130 M. Surrounding them were porous limestone walls with scar-stamped precipices, fissure, and shadowy side entries currently completely dedicated and filled by the adrenaline flowing through their veins, they moved toward the most profound part of the cavern. Once there, they connected rules to a plate secured to the wall by Kai and Sammy, who had recently set it up in the cavern as well as denoting. The date the plates expressed that it had been set there by blades. Furthermore, not local Norwegians next the entry started a long rising, prompting the other cavern entrance, or the exit under 330 IFT or 1000 M away. Patrick and Yari could see the so-called reason to have hope, yet they actually needed to go through an especially restricted segment that made a tight 90 duck turn. Patrick went through first yet, as he went to the corner, he failed to focus on the light from Yar's headlamp. This wasn't a shock, however. To be protected, he convoluted and looked around the corner to ensure his companion was still not far behind him. Patrick restored eye-to-eye -eye connection with Yari. However, he promptly saw that the light emission from his headlamp was going all over unpredictably. This was disturbing in light of the fact that it was a generally perceived indication of a bothered jumper. Patrick motioned and hollered for Yar to come toward him. Yet when his companion didn't move, he switched and made a beeline for him. Rather head currently up close and personal, only a couple of meters from the restricted entry, Yari requested that Patrick move his bike in spare chamber far removed. Since they were impeding his way, Patrick moved them to around 30 EFT or 90 M up the entry. However, Yari actually didn't move from his unique position, and by then he'd turn out to be discernibly unsettled. Patrick didn't know what was occurring until he saw Yari bike rope wedged in a cleft behind two rocks. Yari pulled it free with a strong pull, when he motioned to the line and started crawling towards his companion. Yari was at long last unstuck and moving in the correct course once more, yet he over, and over motioned for Patrick to give him the open circuit reinforcement tank. Patrick gave him the controller a few times, after which Yari changed back to his own rebreather, yet after this time Patrick saw Yar's controller had tumbled from his mouth, he then gave Yari his own controller and squeezed the cleanse button. Yet in such a disturbed state, Yari breathed in excessively fast and sucked in a huge amount of bone-chilling cavern water when his face twisted into a terrible scowl. Patrick realized that there was no way to save him. Patrick was no more bizarre to jumpers in. Trouble, he'd even by and by seen and recovered dead jumpers. Yet this was undeniably more private, steadying himself on a close-by rock. He attempted to resist the urge to panic while cautiously considering his choices. He realized that his life was currently in peril. To two first, he took a gander at the plunge PC to perceive what amount of time his rising would require and the number of stops that he'd need to make en route to his shock. It showed his climb would take north of 400 minutes or almost seven hours when he checked what felt like only a couple of moments before the assessed rising time. Was only 120 minutes as a guideline consistently spent at profundities more noteworthy than 360 FT or 110 M adds no less than 10 minutes to the all-out term of the jump. Considering this, Patrick expected that he'd spent around 25 minutes longer in the section than he initially suspected. In crises like this, jumpers are frequently enticed to climb undeniably more rapidly than they ought to. Anyway, thusly, they fundamentally expanded the gamble of deadly decompression disorder, now with his companions. Body hindering the entry and an agonizing rising. In front of him, Atri couldn't just swim to the surface and let the other three jumpers in the subsequent gathering know what had happened more regrettable. Yet... He'd even given Yari his very own portion valuable oxygen. This intended that there was a decent opportunity that he wouldn't have enough to endure to the furthest limit of this painfully lengthy brief. Climb one way or another. He got no opportunity except for to swim towards the entry and stick to the cavern PC's rising timetable as. Intently as conceivable as Patrick swam away, he couldn't resist the opportunity to consider what might.
happened to Kaivasa and Yaru when they arrived at Yari H's body in the cavern, impeding the way Mage a couple of hours after the fact. Tragically, he'd figured they'd presumably all kick the bucket, and assuming he set head spinning and survived the ordeal he'd need to drive back to Finland without anyone else and illuminate his companions, families that their children, fathers and spouses were dead in the meantime at Aproxima. Telidvaisero p.m. Kvesa and Yaru brought down themselves through the opening in the ice and started advancing towards the far-off cave entrance Kai demanded being rearward in line since he needed to have the option to help the others. In the event that something turned out badly, the three jumpers moved along nicely and came to the enormous air-fill chamber around 20 minutes after the fact. With assistance from the bailout, chambers left by the past gathering they figured they could make the remainder of the navigate. In just four hours anyway, Vasa was hampered by the extra reinforcement chambers he'd brought. Against the desires of the other people who let him know that he wouldn't require them now at a profundity of 410, FT, or 125 M, the chambers kept him from traveling through the especially tight part of the entry and keeping in mind that he was stuck. One of his blades got terribly tangled in one of the rules. Vasa eliminated a few chambers and Yaru unraveled his balance. Yet the episode cost them five extra minutes. This slight postpone implied that their plunge time had quite recently expanded by almost an hour and Kai and Yaru were troubled about making. Extra decompression pauses and investing significantly more energy in the cold water, all things being equal. They trusted they could clear their path through the cavern's tightest point prior to beginning a moderately ordinary rising. Then soon after they began moving again, Fayasa heard an obvious trouble blare coming from a close-by breathing contraption. Only seconds after the fact, he spotted Yari H's dormant body wedged clumsily in a 90 degree curve. He yelled to Kai and Yaru that Yari H gave off an impression of being dead and that his body was obstructing their direction. Now they confronted the unexpected setbacks, since they'd need to eliminate their stuff to get any opportunity of slipping past him through the restricted opening. As of now, things got foggy, yet everybody was obviously in shock, and Kai was at that point experiencing nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis can give jumpers a mind-boggling feeling of quiet. In any event, during perilous occurrences, then again it can impede judgment and coordinated movements and cause bewilderment and frenzy. Kai didn't know whether Yar A.G. was dead since he was wasn't thinking plainly and speaking with. His kindred jumpers was hard without a doubt. Anyway, he saw that Yaru was swimming curiously and exchanging to and fro between his shut circuit and open circuit bailout frameworks. Something was exceptionally off base, and a couple of moments later his body became limp and dormant. Even in his unsafe mental state, Kai realized that he was unable to bear to stay nearby to help his companions, who are, at any rate, in far more regrettable shape than he was, and perhaps currently dead then, at that point. So, on after creating some distance from the terrible scene, he also saw Yari. H's body wedged in the entry to exacerbate the situation. Faso was kicking savagely, attempting to get around it. Kai didn't figure Faso would work everything out such that he yelled for everybody to pivot and head back the manner in which they came. Fisa heard him. Yet he tried not pivot, since he dreaded running out of air prior to coming to the surface with undeniable frenzy setting in faces, taking in oxygen utilization. Expanded quickly, Kai needed to settle on a split choice in light of the fact that the circumstance was turning out to be more critical continuously. He could either stay close by and attempt to help Vasa or let him run wild if needs be and fight for himself. Kai at last picked the stepping stool, and with that, he pivoted and started rising towards the initial they had entered toward the start of the plunge. He realized that the initial brief decompression stop must be made at a profundity of 330 F or 110 M, yet each extra stop would be longer than the one going before it. Kai didn't know whether he'd have sufficient oxygen, assuming he followed the PC-created climb plan, so he, yet again, 
chose to gamble with decompression disorder as opposed to kicking the bucket a difficult demise by suffocating. When he at last came to the long, air-filled chamber, he considered gnawing his time there, until Heroes came for him with a little karma. The oxygen in the chamber could keep him alive for quite a long time. Yet on the off chance that no other person survived the cavern, there was no telling when or regardless of whether a salvage would be started, he chose to continue to move. Yet when, his submerged bike passed on his sad circumstance, turned out to be much more illogical despite such. Overpowering chances he really wanted to harp on the family hanging tight for him back home. What Kai didn't know was Patrick was finishing his own multi-hour climb on the opposite side of the section. With quickly decreasing battery power, he needed to pick either warming his warm vest or moving himself forward, utilizing his submerged bike. He, for the most part, picked versatility over warmth, and when he got cold, he kicked his legs and waved his arms to keep the blood streaming until his next stop. In the interim, Faso was making his own decompression stops not excessively far behind him. During his unbearable climb, Faso was blameworthy to the point that he was unable to help his stricken companions. By then, he'd been in the water for six hours, and like the others, he was arriving at the external furthest reaches of his air supply. Now the three men were making their rising stops ignorant that the others were alive and doing likewise. It seemed like all trust was almost lost, and the frightening difficulty could go on and on forever. Then six hours from the surface, Kai had not much of a choice yet to open the valve on his last. Air chamber, he experienced difficulty making out the small poter on the check, so he didn't know how much air was avoided. Close by, Patrick and Vasa are running with regards to oxygen, and at this point, not ready to make all the essential decompression stops all things being equal Patrick. At last broke the surface only a couple of moments past, 900 p.m., around an hour and a half sooner than the plunge PCs proposed to send Patrick's jump had endured eight and one two hours rather than the first five hours they had expected. Depleted, he plunked down close to the cavern, access to hang tight for Vasa, who he trusted was still someplace behind him, rummaging through his companion's rucksacks, searching for something to eat and drink. He, in the end, saw the light from Vasa's headlamp arising through the haziness. Three hours after the fact, Kai rose up out of the cavern entrance too and swam towards the outer layer of the ice covered lake. He pointed his light at the layer of ice above him and started to search for the jump opening. However, he right away acknowledged it had frozen over, starting from the morning for. Tunately, he did track down it and broke as he would prefer through the ice, and propelled himself and his stuff up and out of the water. By then, it was around 1.00 a.m. In the first part of the day, his jump endured a surprising 11 and a two hours yet, without any indication of his kindred jumpers dreading the most obviously terrible. He strolled to the van, turned on the motor, turned on the headlights, and fell onto the floor. By then, Patrick and Vasa changed into dry garments and got back to the lake. After time everlasting, without indication of the others, they at last separated and called Norwegian specialists, then after 2 p.m. They saw that the van was standing by and the lights were on, going through the freezing air in inky obscurity. They found shuddering on the floor, sure that he was the main survivor. Kai expected that there were interested local people who come to research the puzzling van with unfamiliar plates. Kai Patrick and Vasa were promptly hospitalized, while fresh insight about the passing spread rapidly, even after an extensive stay at a neighborhood emergency clinic. Vasa kept on experiencing issues. Strolling and he was tormented by a strange shivering all around his body of the three Kai experienced the most pessimistic scenario of tension, yet like the others, he was anxious to get back to Norway as fast as conceivable. In the meantime, the police researched what occurred when the doomed jump endeavor specialists scrutinized the three survivors on different occasions, and eventually resolved what should have already been common knowledge that the two Yaris had kicked the bucket in a horrendous mishap that had in short order spiraled crazy. Furthermore, specialists needed to sort out whether or not and how the casualties' bodies would be recovered. From the cavern, they recruited three English jumpers to design and execute the interesting recuperation activity with no other doable choice. 
Soon thereafter, the Brits plummeted into the cavern through the entry. They found the two bodies precisely where different jumpers said they would be. Nevertheless, they couldn't remove them and eventually surrendered in light of the fact that the activity was simply too risky. Subsequently, neighborhood authorities chose to leave the bodies where they were and close the matter for the last time after subtleties of the Arwing misfortune had been delivered. They trusted no other person could at any point endeavor to make the cross between the two cavern openings anyway. When Patrick heard that the bodies wouldn't be recuperated, he watchfully reached a couple of plunging companions to check whether they'd be keen on assisting him with doing it. Everybody concurred, and the gathering of decided blades subtly assembled at the cavern entrance on Spring 26. The, the recuperation activity must be held inconspicuous, so neighborhood specialists wouldn't show up suddenly and shut down it. After a short quietness, they entered the cavern from the two closures and put multiple dozen bailout chambers along the entry. Furthermore, they laid out a submerged living space in which depleted jumpers could rest while playing out their decompression stops. Patrick and Sammy recovered the groups of the two jumpers. Fassa wasn't permitted to plunge because of decompression disorder, yet he helped the activity from the top side. The next morning, the group informed nearby specialists that the departed. Men's bodies had been recuperated and required to have been shipped away from the jump site. The generally stealthy activity at last drew a lot of consideration from nearby and public media sources in Norway, Finland, and Europe. Yet albeit the recuperation exertion was against true requests, no move was made. Against the heroes, strikingly, a brief time frame later. Kai Patrick and Bassa were once again at it, again stacking their stuff into Kai's van. Not long prior to going out on a multi-week cave plunging trip in France and Spain, the excursion had previously been arranged during the Plura cave catastrophe. They contemplated canceling it and surrendering cave jumping for good. However, as is commonly said, you can't teach an old dog new tricks.